An Investec Derby winner starts with the bloodline. Mare, foal, there's a strong bond. You work with them, bringing them on. Training, dedication. In your heart, you know they're a Derby winner. And what if they do win the greatest flat race in the world? Well, there are some feelings you could never put into words. The last half century has brought some fundamental changes to the sport of thoroughbred horse racing. And not all of it has benefited Epsom. Epsom is, of course, the home of the Investec Derby and the Investec Oaks, and several other races belonging to the pages of history. In fact, it is the holy grail of thoroughbred horse racing. If you speak to the managing director of the Investec Group, Bernard Cantor, he will tell you that the Investec Oaks have been around a very long time. In fact, since 1779. For any of you who think that we haven't been around that long, the Investec Oaks have been around for 235 years. The story we are here to tell is that of Epsom trainer Simon Dow, a passionately committed and dedicated man who has lived in the Epsom area for over 30 years. To anyone who would care to listen, Simon Dow would tell you that the horse population on Epsom Downs has decreased dramatically in the last half century. Horse racing is a game of numbers, and with the reduction of numbers in this particular area, there is an obvious decline in performance. There are no derby winners being trained here at the moment, though Epsom trained horses continue to do well. The key to successful training is having quality gallops on hand, and these Simon is proud to tell you have never been better at Epsom. People often forget that the Downs are owned by the racecourse, who in turn own some of the most valuable real estate on the planet. I think even as a schoolboy, I can remember um, riding ponies on the, on the Downs on the permitted hack rides. And uh, coincidentally, I finished up helping at a local stables where the, the uh, proprietor had been a national health hunt jockey and had served his entire apprenticeship and uh, subsequent training career in Epsom and um, sort of stayed on there and gradually got bitten by the bug. And uh, you know what horse racing is like, it's quite addictive. And uh, at the age I was 14, um, racing was the equine discipline that suited my temperament and uh, my views about uh, horse racing and ho the horse world generally is best. Simon, there seems to have been a paradigm shift of the horse population that was prevalent in the 60s, 70s, that were trained in the Epsom Downs area as opposed to other jurisdictions. And that to me is one of the greatest anomalies of the most famous thoroughbred horse race in the world. Yeah, well, certainly when I was there, it's 40 years ago, there's probably the same number in the sort of late 1960s, there would have been the same number of horses in training in Epsom as there were in Newmarket. And the Downs was owned by a great man called Stanley Wooten, who, uh, or the, mo the majority of the training grounds were owned by him, and he was a trainer himself. And um, he left the Downs in perpetuity to, to the race course and effectively safeguarded horse training in, on Epsom Downs for the future. But uh, in the late 70s, the arrival of the Arab families and their, um, and their wish to, to um, develop their racehorse ownership in interest in the UK, which was, of course, the, the centre of, of, of world horse racing, uh, then if, it, if, it, if it's diversified a bit now. But... Uh, Prince Khalid Abdullah, who of course founded Jabmont Farms, and um, Prince Fahad Salman, who's probably best known for his on the race course for generous winning, winning the Derby and uh, the many horses that he had in training. Both of them had their very first horses. They were both clients of the British Bloodstock Association, and they had their first horses trained with Ron Smythe in Epsom in the in the late 60s and early 70s. And history uh, then shows uh, how they've gone on to influence um, the world racing scene. So um, I suppose there was an opportunity at one stage for, for the Arab families to very much base themselves here. But um, history tells us that for, for whatever reasons, they uh, moved to Newmarket and developed there. Epsom is, as you know, a, a good stone's throw from the, from the centre of, of London. And um, as the suburban sprawl has 
drifted our way. Many of our training bases, which were closer to Epsom and closer to the town centre, have been lost to the developers. And indeed, uh, in just the way, same way as many people in England uh, have got hugely wealthy through uh, the, the increase in property prices in the 70s and 80s, many trainers were not in a position to, uh, to, to sell their yard on to stay in horse racing. They sold their yards on to build flats and lovely houses. And um, so the number of stables that we had to use, both individual boxes and actual, actual training yards, uh, was quite reduced, quite dramatically so, because of, the, because of the land prices. What I found absolutely incredible was even on Derby Day, I saw the general public walking on the downs, and it's intriguing to know what sort of rights they've got as opposed to licensed trainers. There's a lot of politics involved, and we, we could devote a, a whole hour to just talking about um, the, um, the rights of the multi-users of Epsom Downs, and Epsom Downs incorporates the training grounds. Uh, it would be probably the only training centre in probably Europe where the public have this, as much right of air and exercise close to the proximity of the gallops, and indeed over the gallops once, they, once they're shut. One would imagine that this is to the detriment of, the, of a training centre, but actually well managed as it is and uh, carefully preserved as it is by the, by the dedicated conservators who administrate the Parliamentary Act which relates to the use of Epsom Downs, it actually works really well and um, you get horses who are trained in quite a sterile, uh, thoroughbred only environment, uh, as we've all seen all over the world. In Epsom, horses get to see a slightly different way of life, uh, and that suits some horses and not others, but um, the vast majority of them. Epsom is horse racing, certainly in the UK, Epsom Downs is horse racing's best kept secret. And uh, although the critical mass of horses which could be trained on the Downs because of the urbanization, in other words, the, the, the number of current training yards which are available to tra for trainers to use, although because the critical mass is well below what it would have been in, in the late 70s or 80s, we still are able to um, show an acceptable business churn when it comes to the costs of administrating the training centre against the amount of money that we have coming in. And that churn shows enough of a profit for us to, to invest in the training centre and improve the facilities and, and modernise them at the same rate as, as you would in, uh, expect to see in, in any of anywhere in, in the world. I think also the important thing to remember is that pro rata, the number of winners that Epsom trainers achieve on an annual basis, would be hugely competitive. Per, per, per number of winners with, with anywhere else. And, and we've got to go back to um, the late 90s to find uh, the likes of Lake Coniston, the likes of Heave Golf Rose. Uh, I had a horse called Young Earn, uh, three uh, urban requests of Reg, uh, Reg Acres, who were all international horses, all international travellers. They all won group races all over the world. Heave Golf Rose won the Abbey as well, you know, a big group one winner. And at the same time, uh, Reg Acres, who, who trained Urgent Request as well, was training hundreds of winners over jumps as well. You know, it's amazing what can come off, off this, these downs here. And of course, yeah, we go back in history, as you say, the origins of the sport are on, on the very downs themselves. And, uh, you know, his, the history books tell us of, of all, the, all the wonderful horses that have been trained here. Uh, the, key for, the key for my colleagues and myself going into the future is to ensure that we turn over every stone in order to um, demonstrate to uh, potential owners uh, the benefits of having a horse in training so that we can just increase that number that we have all of us and we all work very closely together to ensure that that occurs so it gives ourselves the best chance of coming across a star because as you know you can do the job really really right you've got to kiss a lot of frogs to find the princes simon how do you explain the relatively paltry participation of epsom trainers as far as epsom oaks and derby day were concerned respectively when you look at the amount of people that come from newmarket from ireland from lambourne from even andrew balling's way up near Newbury. It's a very, very strange phenomenon as far as we're concerned. It is. I mean, not only is it really difficult to get a horse of the calibre who stands the preparation uh, to get to the race day, and we all know any of us who've ever trained a horse of, of any description, whether it's a race horse or, or, or a show jumper or an event or us, to get the horse absolutely bang on on the day is a challenge in itself. Um, but um, not only is there the issue of the horses that have got 
the, the, the most ability. There's also the issue of the horses who st have enough maturity, because the Oaks and the Derby, as you say, on, the, on uh, this time of the year, is very early this year, wasn't it? You know, the very end of May, very beginning of June, literally, it can't be run any earlier. And horse, three-year-old horses are only just coming to hand, really, midway through their third year. They're only at full maturity midway through their third year. So, although the best horse, of course, wins the race on the day, there, there must be an awful lot of horses who have comparable ability who just don't get to the race. The ownership of property in this particular jurisdiction is not pretty straightforward as it would be in London, for example, because there are certain parts of the Constitution that protect the land. And of course, it's an economic viability to have property sold for commercial gain as opposed to keeping them in the racing environment. How does it really work, Simon? Well, effectively, if you had a new unit built from which racehorse training was operating, you would only be given permission to have that built in extremely certain circumstances, and if it was on, particularly if it was on the green belt. And if that was the case, it would have a covenant attached to it, and any re refurbishment in the last 15 years of existing stables and any development of existing stables has had a covenant attached to it which says along the lines of uh, only the business of training racehorses can be done from this site as a business business entity. And so whilst the place could be used for re normal residential, um, you couldn't run any business from it other than racehorse training. Obviously, to run a racehorse training business, you've got to be a licensed trainer and that means you have to have the appropriate accreditation by the, by the British authorities. Simon, looking out of my window at the Holiday Inn Express, which is probably the most strategically positioned hotel I can ever think of, I can see your horses arriving back from work and departing the track. And I know that it's very difficult to cross that busy road where people are ostensibly quite horse friendly, but you still have to wait for the light to change. And for that reason, I know that you have mooted the fact that you're looking at alternative premises in the immediate vicinity, probably the most steeped in history of all the properties uh, formerly belonging to Lord Derby. So tell us about your dream of occupying this property. Absolutely, yes. Well, you know, I've made no secret of the fact that Downs House, which is uh, probably the oldest training stables on Epsom Downs, is council-owned and is on the market. It's situated in the uh, most wonderful uh, position possible, really, right in the heart of Epsom Downs, just adjacent to the to the Derby start. And it's a 10-acre property with um, with a four, currently 42 boxes and, uh, and a big five-bedroom house with flats, etc. It's absolutely perfect site to be a training centre, but also vitally important to the to the health and wealth of uh, of the of the Downs and the local area. That it, it that that is the business that operates from there because um, the incumbents or the occupants will be the natural guardians of the downs they will be the people who are living residing and and uh, looking after we even without uh, realizing uh, the safety of the of the peripheral area which is epsom downs they will be the only residents on epsom downs uh, where we are now, yes, I, I think it has, uh, as I say, the, the, uh, the urbanisation of the area, with us being about as peripheral as you probably can afford to be or can, can bear to be, um, has its own, own uh, strengths and, and, and disadvantages. As you know yourself from spending time there over the last couple of days, the, the views are really panoramic and we have, the, we have the grandstand behind us. We're very high. Uh, it's a very airy, very healthy spot for horses to be. And uh, they literally are looking out over Wembley, uh, the Wembley Arch and, and the historical London skyline. We can see right round to Canary Wharf and back to the West End. Having said that, uh, it is an increasingly busy road to cross and uh, the traffic um, activity around the grandstand it, it has intensified and, and it, 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 you know, although I would like to move because it would, uh, what, sorry, it would suit me to move because it will round my career nicely. Um, so it, it's a stable I spent some time at when I was uh, much younger and, uh, and um, it, I, would, I feel that you know, I've been here 20 years, it's about time to do something different. I guess that the element of irony is significant that your name is Simon Down. Down's house is the property that you wish to occupy. But I suppose more than anything else with a complement of 20 or 25 horses now, the opportunity exists to expand your operation and to acquire new patrons from outside, which will obviously make it more economically viable than it currently is at the moment. 
And of course, we all know that the consequence of coincidence is sometimes the most powerful force on the planet. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, my, uh, my father was a bank manager and his uh, view on uh, racehorse training was that it was an extremely precarious business and one would have to be bonkers to get involved. And I think uh, certainly the longer that I've been involved in horse racing, the more uh, credence his uh, views have held to me. And uh, from, a, from a, as a financial package, particularly uh, in the circumstances that, you know, a lot of people find themselves in 2013 all over the world, uh, keeping a business like this running financially soundly is a challenge and, and is, is not straightforward and yes of course the, the question comes uh, can you make yourself more financially secure by becoming bigger can you make yourself uh, more financially secure by uh, staying in a small uh, with a small team with with less um, less liabilities but the, you're quite right in as much as the, the attraction of Downs House is the massive uh, leap up in attraction that the location has because whilst where I am is extremely functional and it suits though, it's very healthy for the horses and for all the reasons that I've already outlined, uh, there's, has, this has a certain grandeur, a certain style um, and that, you know, as having done sort of 15 years as a conservator on the downs myself, um, uh, representing the levy board and the, and the trainers, um, you know, I, I found myself very passionately interested and I have a, a vested interest in, in the health of the, of the area and particularly the downs themselves. Simon, obviously time doesn't really permit us to go through each and every horse in your yard, but the one filly that I find particularly intriguing is the filly that came so close to stardom in last year's Investec Dash when she led almost to the wire but was snared right in the shadow of the post in the closing stages. And of course, it doesn't really compare to winning the Oaks or the Derby, but nothing quite like winning a race on Derby Day and this little filly, Fair Value, as you've said before, not exactly an oil painting, but clearly got speed to burn, a lot of heart, and we'd like to know what's left in the tank with her. Yes, it was an amazingly exciting day. Uh, Fair Value was owned and bred locally um, by a guy called Edward Hyde, who had horses in training and a great fellow, and he had horses with my colleague, Brooke Sanders, who's now retired, and uh, when Brooke retired, she uh, recommended that uh, I could perhaps train this particular filly. She's not an oil painting, but she's extremely honest. She's got amazing speed, and she's always trained very, very well. This filly is really very effective when she's rattling. Uh, I don't think any horse really loves firm ground, but uh, some horses go on it and some horses don't. And she has shown a marked preference for her for fast ground because she's got so much speed if she's allowed to rip. And, um, and I think we're probably just a little unlucky that uh, we didn't have the weather that we've had this week uh, last week and, and that sort of goes back to the fact that under normal circumstances in England although we've had a pretty rotten winter and as you know yourselves the recent daytime temperatures haven't been great although we're sitting here in nice sunshine today uh, it's just a week too soon for us. Fair value leads now to Captain Dunn entering the final furlong Fair value, about a length clear of Captain Dunn. Then La Fortunata, Gear off Dinkum Diamonds running on well. Smooth talking lines. Duke of Frenzy is dashing at them as well under Ryan Moore. And Duke of Frenzy snatches it. And it all changed in the final 50 because smooth talking rascal was also flying. Absolutely unbelievable. Now, having had the opportunity to see all the things that you do as a trainer, riding out in the morning, grooming your horses, mucking out your admin, communication, veterinary work, all that sort of stuff, kinesiology, uh, chiropractic. It certainly adds a lot of credence to those people who want personal attention for their particular horse in your yard. Yeah, I mean, I, would, I think, given that I've got so much experience, I've been doing it for a very long time, we've trained 600 winners of all sort of varying different standards, some of them internationally. Uh, having said that, the reason I have to do all those things at the moment is as much as anything because the economic climate in, in the UK. But at the same time, um, it's reminded me in the way that I currently conduct my business of the importance of attention to detail and the fact that, as you say, uh, I'm probably using this period of my life, not as a, I'm not sure whether in 10 years' time, Andrew, I'm still going to be riding six lots out in the morning, but... Uh, Father time catches up with you. Father time catches up with all of us, but uh, at the moment I'm enjoying it and I, I'm finding that the experience that, I, the experience that I've got is of huge benefit and I'm still learning. I think, you know, that's the most important thing, you know, uh, that uh, each day what is as fascinating as anything about these animals is that every single one of them teaches you something new. An Investec Derby winner starts with the bloodline. Mare, foal, there's a strong bond. 
You work with them, bringing them on. Training, dedication. In your heart, you know they're a derby winner. And what if they do win the greatest flat race in the world? Well, there are some feelings you could never put into words.